chapter two had atoms, moles, and ions. So the chapter is pretty much split up into two two main parts. Um, the first part talks about uh, a lot of background information on the development of the atomic theory, and then the second part is all about naming these um, atoms and, and molecules and ions, that sort of thing. So we'll focus on a lot of conceptual stuff in the beginning, it'll almost seem like a history lesson, we'll look at the development of the atomic theory, and then move on to, uh, to naming. So the first theory we'll look at is uh, Dalton, John Dalton's atomic theory, and there's four main points here. Um, and the first one, you know, and, and this sort of thing comes up as like a multiple choice type of question. Um, I'm not going to ask you to list all the all the four points, but you should be familiar with them and um, you, should, you should know them, what each one of those means. So the first one says that each element is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. So everything's made up of atoms and they're really small. He wasn't the first person to come up with this, you know, this part of the theory. The Greeks have been talking about that for a long, a long time before him. Um, the second one says that all atoms of a given element are identical, but atoms of one element are different from atoms of another element. So that's basically saying that all oxygen looks like oxygen, and all nitrogen looks like nitrogen, and oxygen looks different than nitrogen. We'll see how this one breaks down a little bit later when we start talking about isotopes, um, but for now we just, you know, we want to get his four main points. Uh, number three says that atoms of one element can cannot be changed into atoms of a different element by a chemical reaction. Um, so not by a chemical reaction. Uh, atoms are neither created nor destroyed during a chemical uh, a chemical process, chemical reaction. So that that you know we're not talking about nuclear reactions here. Um, this helps explain uh, later when we're, we start balancing equations why we need to have the same number of oxygen atoms on both sides. Um, and this is, you know, really just saying that you can't turn an oxygen atom into a nitrogen. So, you know, uh, we're, we're not going to learn any alchemy here. We can't turn everything into gold. Uh, the last, the last point just says that if you combine, combine a whole bunch of elements together, you get a compound. So here you have N and O and, and put them together. Uh, and now this is a compound. So a compound is made up of uh, two or more different kinds of elements. All right. So you should be familiar with all those. Uh, the, those four main points, that's uh, Dalton's atomic theory. Uh, the law of conservation of mass just says um, that when you have a chemical, at the end of a, a chemical process, you should have the amount, the same amount of substances as what you started with. I see a typo there, so uh, at the end, yeah, just there, the end of a chemical process, uh, you should get the same amount as you had before, so we'll see that when we, when we balance reactions. All right, so now we'll start um, talking a little bit about more of the experiments that were used to uh, determine what the atomic structure um, kind of looked like. So the first first scientist we're going to look at is J.J. Thompson. Um, here we go, Thompson. This was done around 1897, and there's a YouTube video that kind of shows the, you know the electrons flowing through this cathode ray tube. It's kind of cool. You should check this out. It'll explain this in a little more uh, a little more in depth than there are what I'm going to talk about now. Um, but basically, you have this, this cathode tube. You have electrons kind of streaming in here, and um, the the end result. And I don't, I don't, you don't have to memorize all of the uh, all the particulars here, but the end result was that by doing a series of experiments, he was able to come up with the charge to mass ratio. So he couldn't get it was of an electron. So he couldn't get the charge of an electron or the mass of an electron, but this ratio of charge to mass kept coming up again and again. So this was a constant. So using the this is the, the cathode ray experiment, um, and this is the cathode ray tube, uh, Thompson was able to get the charge to mass ratio of an electron. Now, building on his work, and that's what you'll see in science a lot of times, someone will do an experiment, somebody else will build on that. Uh, Millikan did his famous oil drop experiment, okay, and there's a YouTube video that, you know, shows this a little bit better as well. You, should, um, you have an electronic copy of the notes, so you can also just look this up and watch the video. So Millikan, um, you know, a little bit after, after Thompson did his experiment, um, Millikan was able to determine the mass of an electron, determine the mass of an electron using this oil drop experiment, which basically had oil drops here, um, and, and you ionize them, so they're going to, um, and then watch them measure how fast they're falling, what's their, their rate of falling, and using this, you know, compli complicated experiment, he was able to find um, the mass of an electron. So now if you know the charge to mass ratio, let's write that down here, so if you know the charge to mass ratio, so that's like, if you know charge over mass, and you know the charge, 
which is what actually what he got at this experiment was the charge, um, then you'll be able to figure out what the mass is. And so the end result is using the, um, using the, the result of the oil drop experiment as well as J.J. Um, Thompson's experiment. Um, they were able to get the charge to mass ratio from the first one, the charge from the second one, you put it all together and you get the mass of an electron. And it turns out an electron doesn't have a lot of mass. It's very, very small mass. And so they assumed, they made this assumption that since um, the electron doesn't contribute much to the overall mass of the atom, then the, uh, it shouldn't contribute much to the overall volume of the atom as well. That was their assumption. Um, and right around this time, also, radioactivity was being discovered. Uh, so ra radioactivity is just the uh, spontaneous emission of radiation by an atom. And it was first discovered, or first observed by Henri Becquerel, uh, who basically had a, a chunk of uranium in his lab, and it was sitting next to a photographic plate, and it exposed the, exposed the, the photographic plate. So um, it, was, um, it was emitting some kind of radiation. So it was uh, serendipitous. He were, they weren't looking for this experiment. It just kind of happened by accident. Uh, he must have had like a messy lab, like what most scientists do. And um, they were able to recognize that something important was happening there, and then they, then they studied it. So uh, you may not have heard of Henri Becquerel, but you probably have heard of Marie and Pierre Curie, and they kind of worked with Becquerel. They uh, shared the Nobel Prize for their discovery in um, 1903. Uh, so right around this time, you have you have all these experiments happening. You have Thompson doing his experiment, and then Millikan um, doing the oil drop experiment. They discover that electrons don't weigh very much; they have they don't have much mass. Um, and so they wanted to, you know, they come up with this assumption that because it, the electron doesn't contribute much to the mass of, of the atom, then it probably doesn't contribute much to the volume. And so they want to they want to um, study that. They want to prove that theory or disprove that theory. And so they're, they're going to use some of this new radioactivity that's been discovered. So Ernest Rutherford was another guy who was looking at radioactivity. And he looked at, uh, he discovered alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma rays. And the alpha particles are what, uh, what he decided to use to test um, Thompson's model, atomic model of the, of the uh, sorry, yeah, his atomic model. Um, and so this is what his uh, Thompson's model looks like. He called it the plum pudding model. Plum pudding is a um, disgusting dessert <laughs> that what I, I think is disgusting. It's just like plum, it's pudding, and then uh, inside you have these like chunks of of, uh, of raisins and things. And so they they thought that the, that, they were, that was their analogy for what the atom looked like. They said, okay, so you have this um, positive uh, charge and just kind of immersed throughout, that. that's the, the gooey stuff, the uh, pudding part. And then the raisins are these negative electrons that are kind of stuck through there. And so that's what, what they thought the, um, uh, what the you know, atom kind of looked like. So they said, all right, again, electrons, very, very small, don't contribute that much to the mass, so they just assumed it also don't contribute much to the volume. Uh, so you can see that the electrons there are just kind of not really doing much, they're just kind of stuck in there, like raisins in, in uh, pudding. So how do they how do they test this model? They used something um, they used the alpha particles in uh, an experiment that they called the gold foil experiment. Okay, so again, there's another video here you can actually watch some um, you know, an animation of this, which is kind of nice. Um, so you have you have a piece of gold foil here, um, and then you shoot it with alpha particles. And alpha particles are just uh, they're they're heavy particles. They're positive. They're, they're basically helium atoms. And um, what's going to happen is you fire it right at the uh, at the foil, and what they expected that if this is what the um, if the if the plum pudding model was correct, then every time one of these alpha particles uh, finds you know a, a positive piece of matter, then they would collide, they'd repel each other, and you'd see kind of this uh, alpha particle being deflected in, a, in a, like a large angle all the way around. And what they found, though, was that most of the alpha particles just went right through the gold foil. They just went right through, meaning that they didn't really see a lot of positive, uh, a lot of positive charge, um, or, or a lot of mass either. So it just kind of went right through. And so you can kind of see down here what's happening. And again, this is a lot um, clearer on the on the video uh, that yeah, the, the alpha particles are just going uh, right through there. So what that really means is that this, this model is not right. This Thompson's plum pudding model is no good. 
um, that the, the positive part, a lot of the mass has to be really, really, really small. And, um, and what happens is every time they do find that, so when they find what we're now called the nucleus, so when they hit the nucleus, the nucleus is positively charged and it's really small, but that's where all the mass is. So all the positive charge and all the mass of the atom is located in this really small area here. So this is the really small area. And when the alpha particle finds that, it, it, then it definitely collides with it. It, uh, it, it um, deflects back at a really large angle. So uh, Rutherford described this as, you know, I'll use sort of modern terms. He said, like, if you were to fire a cannonball at a paper towel, and then every now and then, uh, you know, you would expect that the, the, the cannonball would you know, break through the paper towel. So the paper towel is the gold foil, um, and the uh, cannon is the um, alpha particle. So every time, you know, you would, you would think it would just go right through. Uh, but what happens is every now and then, when it hits the nucleus, uh, that paper towel kind of fires the cannonball back at itself. Um, and uh, so that's kind of crazy. So the main point is that the nucleus is really small. It has all the positive charge and all the mass is located there. Uh, the nucleus, if you want to get a, a visual for how small it is um, compared to the atom, I think, I think our book or another book shows that if you, if you ha were holding a marble in your hand and you were inside like a giant stadium, like a football stadium, uh, the marble represents the nucleus and the stadium is the rest of the atom. So it's really, 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 really small. And that's where all the mass is. And so what's that, that empty space over here is mostly uh, those electrons kind of moving around. So electrons actually do contribute a lot to the volume because they're, they're moving around. That's it's taking up the space in the, in the um, atom. But the, the positive charge in the mass is really small and that's located in the nucleus. All right, so we'll stop there.